started. Can everybody hear me OK? All right, cool. Uh, I'm Sam. Uh, we're going to be talking about Bluetooth low energy and core Bluetooth. Core Bluetooth is Apple's framework for building um, Bluetooth low, or apps that work with Bluetooth low energy devices. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as um, S. Kirchmeier. And I'm part of the team at Livefront. Um, at Livefront, we uh, build mobile apps for iPhone and Android. Um, I'm primarily an iOS developer there, although I do lots of different kinds of software development stuff. Um, recently, I've had an opportunity to work on a couple of projects with Bluetooth uh, low energy, and it kind of blew my mind. It's like super awesome, so I'm excited to get a chance to kind of share my experience with it and uh, do a couple demos. Um, that's part of my plan. Um, so this is going to be a technical talk. I'm sure a lot of you know that if you're familiar with core Bluetooth um, or Bluetooth low energy. Um, the first half or so, we're going to just kind of talk about what Bluetooth low energy is, what it's good for. Um, hopefully, I can convince you that it's awesome. You won't need much convincing because it's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and then the last half, we're, we're going to dive into Xcode and use core Bluetooth and do a couple cool demos. Um, so if, you're, if your eyes glaze over the thought of source code or the sight of source code, try to hang in there. Um, hopefully, we'll have, we'll have some hopefully cool demos. We'll see. So uh, what is Bluetooth low energy? Um, and what makes it so awesome. Uh, um, before we talk about that, it's important to understand that the Bluetooth that we all already know is different. And I'm going to refer to that actually as Bluetooth Classic um, for this talk. So um, Bluetooth Classic, you know, we all either have a headset that syncs with our phone or uh, we, we you know, pair your phone with your car so you can listen to music in the car. So we've got kind of this, it's like the standard wireless technology that we use. Um, for all our peripherals. So why do we need another wireless um, technology? Why, why do we need Bluetooth low energy? Um, Bluetooth low energy really is designed from the ground up to maximize battery life. Um, and we're talking about uh, ultra low power um, peripherals. So these are things that run on a coin cell battery, and that battery might last for months or a year or even more. Um, and so it's a, a, a different architecture. It's not backwards compatible. Uh, and we're talking about a whole new class of peripherals. So it's, it's important, to, I think, just to make that distinction between Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy. We're talking about two different things. So part of the way that works, and we'll, we'll get into a little more detail on this, but part of the way that works is um, it's designed to send small bits of data um, very quickly in short bursts just to maximize battery life. So. Um, with Bluetooth Classic, you know, you can do streaming, like audio streaming to listen to music, but that sort of thing doesn't work with Bluetooth Low Energy. It just doesn't have the capability to do, um, to send that much data. Um, so a little more history on Bluetooth. We'll, we'll kind of blow through this, but uh, it was adapted from um, standard Bluetooth in 2001, started by uh, Nokia. Uh, they kind of saw this need for a kind of a new, new kind of group of peripherals that Bluetooth didn't really work for. Um, they made quite a bit of progress on it, marketed it as something completely different initially, and then as of Bluetooth 4.0, it's officially rolled back into the specification. So it's an official part of Bluetooth, um, and the iPhone 4S was the first commercial peripheral to, ha to have Bluetooth low energy support in October 2011, and it's awesome. <laughs> um, so thinking about kind of a typical Bluetooth classic peripheral, I think the kind of wireless headset is a good example of that. This is a, a kind of a typical Bluetooth low energy peripheral. Um, it's a wristwatch citizen. You can sync this with your iPhone and they can communicate with each other. Um, there are a couple things that are really interesting about this particular watch, I think. This is powered by um, EcoDrive, which is like basically magic, I think. It's not magic, it's science. It's totally science, but it's like a, a, a solar powered faceplate for the watch. So the, you don't actually have to change the battery in this watch. It's just, it's solar powered. And it's a wireless peripheral, which is kind of awesome. Um, there are other things that are cool about it. Uh, if I, you can't really see this. If I fade out the, the watch, it's kind of hard to see. But around the faceplate, I'm not sure if you can read those up there. There are little indicators kind of on the very edge. And there's like mail and call. And so um, what happens is if you miss a call on your phone, your phone can 
tell the watch that you missed a call, and then the second hand actually spins around and just points like at call. So then when you look at your watch, you can see, oh yeah, I missed a call because my second hand isn't spinning around like it normally does. So it's kind of an interesting user interface. Um, I like this kind of idea of an analog. It's like, it's like this digital device that's analog, but kind of interesting. So there are three, um, three things I find really interesting about Bluetooth low energy that I want to touch on today. Um, it's ubiquitous. Number two, it's inexpensive. And number three, it's hackable. This is a good kind of hackable. And two and three uh, really distinguish Bluetooth low energy from Bluetooth classic. Um, so how is it ubiquitous? It actually isn't quite ubiquitous yet, um, but it will be soon. And that has a lot to do with the fact that it's part of the Bluetooth specification. Um, this means that the industry that's creating these peripherals and creating these radios has already endorsed it, and it's, it's not going anywhere. Um, it's also important because it means that Bluetooth low energy can kind of piggyback on the success of Bluetooth. Um, the Bluetooth special interest group uh, predicts that two thirds of all cell phones will have Bluetooth low energy radios in them this year. And by 2016, that'll be 100%. And really this 100% number means that anywhere, any peripheral where you see a Bluetooth radio right now, by 2016, that will either be a Bluetooth low energy radio or it will be a dual mode radio that supports Bluetooth classic and Bluetooth low energy. So this isn't the whole picture. From a software developer's perspective, this is great that we have a lot of coverage with Bluetooth, but in order to write apps that interface with these peripherals, we need a software stack as well. So even if we have Bluetooth low energy radios everywhere, it doesn't do us much good without software. So this is a chart that shows kind of the current state of um, uh, mobile platforms and, and their support for Bluetooth low energy. And so we have a lot of check marks in the yes column, which is good, one in the no there for Windows Phone and then Android gets its own column. <laughs> it's complicated. Um, it, Bluetooth low energy, there are actually a lot of Android phones that have Bluetooth low energy radios, but um, it's not officially supported by the Android SDK yet. So manufacturers have kind of gone off on their own and not waiting for Google. They've built their own Bluetooth low energy libraries, but those are not compatible with each other. They're specific to the hardware of that manufacturer's device. So from a software developer's perspective, that kind of sucks because then if you want to support the maximum number of devices, you have to build kind of an interface to each one of those libraries and it's a big mess. Um, the good news is that uh, there's kind of anecdotal evidence, at least online, from Google engineers saying that this is a priority internally and they're working on it and um, you know, no ETA for when it's gonna be supported, but this will eventually make it into the Android SDK. And a similar story with Windows Phone. Um, just, you know, Microsoft engineers have commented online, but not, not in any official capacity. Uh, it's also inexpensive, and this, this, this really just means inexpensive compared to developing software and hardware um, with Bluetooth Classic. It's an inexpensive in a couple of different ways. Um, one thing that this is, I, I really think this is a huge deal and makes Bluetooth low energy uh, really fun to experiment with is that made for iPhone is not required. Does anyone have um, experience with made for iPhone, made for iPhone program? Adam, you do? Do, do, you, do you have any comments on it or thoughts on it? Any, uh, like you had to summarize the experience? It's expensive and time consuming. Okay, expensive and time consuming, yeah. yeah. Yep, yeah, so good. That's good to hear that it's expensive, yeah, Nate. What is made for iPhone? So this is, this is Apple's program. If you, um, if you develop a peripheral for uh, like an iPhone or an iPad and you use the 30 pin dock connector, Apple makes you go through this process. They make you sign up. You actually have to apply to the program and they can just reject you and not let you in. Or if they accept you, like Adam said, it gets expensive because they require you to pay a third party to do testing for your peripheral to make sure it doesn't interfere with things and it's well behaved and all that stuff. There's also potentially licensing fees involved, you know, as well. So um, it's, it's, and that, that goes not only for uh, peripherals that you connect with a dock connector, but also Bluetooth classic peripherals as well, if you wanna write software that interfaces with a peripheral. So it, it, Bluetooth low energy gets around this um, primarily because of the way um, it maximizes battery life. It's less of, a, less of an issue to just have an app on your phone that uses Bluetooth low energy. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's also less expensive because Bluetooth Low Energy is a simpler software stack. It's a completely different architecture than Bluetooth Classic. So Bluetooth Low Energy is um, generally, since it's simpler, it's cheaper to implement in hardware. It's easier, uh, cheaper, uh, 
It's also smaller because batteries can be smaller, so enclosures can be smaller, so manufacturing costs can be lower. And this is actually the fun one, I think. It's also very hackable, which is kind of awesome. And this may be the only time you ever see an Apple technology on the same slide as the word hackable, but this is really true. Core Bluetooth goes a long way to making, um, kind of exposing a lot of the features of Bluetooth low energy without a lot of limitations. And you can even do stuff in the background, which is, if you're an iOS developer, you know what kind of, how much, um, I don't know what the right word is, but just how how, uh, how much Apple really locks down what you can do in the background and what you can't. So it's nice that uh, this gives you the opportunity to, to kind of do some things in the background. Um, because it's it saves battery life, um, the, the interaction with Bluetooth per low energy peripherals in the iOS and, and iOS is very different than the interaction with Bluetooth classic peripherals in iOS in that um, you know when you pair like a headset or something, you have to go through settings and then you see a list of all your Bluetooth devices. The OS kind of gets in the way there. It's like it wants to control all of those interactions. With Bluetooth low energy, um, all of that's left up to you as a software developer and your app. You're responsible for scanning for devices, connecting to them, remembering which ones you've connected to, disconnecting, all of that stuff. So that gives you a huge amount of flexibility um, and just lets you, it's, it's great for experimentation. And then again, just to reiterate this, there's no uh, made for iPhone required. So you can write your own app and you can put it in the app store and as long as you pass the standard app, Apple approval process, um, you don't have to do any more than that to write an app that's interacting with wireless peripherals. There's also lots of cool hardware um, available. So this is a this is an experimenting kit, kind of like a development kit from Texas Instruments. It's a, uh, it comes with a key fob and a USB adapter and these are both programmable. So for 100 bucks and a MacBook, you can start hacking away on your own custom wireless peripheral to make it do whatever you want. Um, this is a similar kit from Blue Giga. Those works basically the same way. It's a little bit more expensive. Um, and Arduino, actually we're gonna be using an Arduino for uh, the demos, so I've got this Arduino up here. Uh, we'll hook that up later. Um, if you're not familiar with Arduino, it's uh, it's a really inexpensive like uh, microprocessor that you can program via USB. I'm sure a lot of you have Arduinos and have experimented with them. Um, it's cheap to get a Bluetooth adapter for your Arduino, about 30 bucks, and that's what I'm using here. Uh, this is also a cool peripheral. I'm using one of these as well. This lets you use Bluetooth low energy from the iOS simulator. So if you're an iOS developer, you can do all of your development in the simulator. You don't have to load the app on your phone and test from your phone. So this is cool and cheap. Um, so just to recap, ubiquitous, inexpensive, and hackable, and awesome, my part, number four. Um, so there's, uh, there, there are products out there, quite a few products. Some of them are really basic, like heart rate monitors, things you'd kind of expect, like things that you can kind of picture and think of that might be operated by a coin cell battery. Um, heart rate monitor, uh, thermometer, or thermostat. Um, we're gonna look at a couple of the more interesting examples that I've just kind of found online. Um, before we do that, I just wanna mention Bluetooth Smart and Bluetooth Smart Ready. These are the terms that the Bluetooth Special Interest Group uses to market. Bluetooth Low Energy, so you don't actually see Bluetooth Low Energy on product packaging, you'll see Bluetooth Smart and Bluetooth Smart Ready. Um, smart is just like the peripheral, and Smart Ready is like a, a computer or a device that you'd connect multiple peripherals to. Fitbit uses BLE. Um, the latest version uses it to sync in the background. Does anyone have a Fitbit? A few people, okay. So for those of you that don't know what this is, it's like a pedometer, basically you wear it all day and it tells you how many calories you burned because you walked thousand miles or something. Um, and it can sync uh, wirelessly in the background without any intervention on your part with your phone, which is kind of cool. Uh, hip key, this is like a key fob that you, you put on your keychain and then if your phone and your keychain get separated too far, it'll beep at you. You could also put it on your child or something. <laughs> you really could, I think. Um, stick and find is similar. This is like a little sticker. Uh, this actually is a good example, that disc right there, this is a good example of kind of the size of peripheral we're talking about. It's, this includes the battery, the enclosure, the radio, everything, um, and an LED light. Um, this, is, this is something you'd like stick on something that you don't wanna lose and then when you lose that thing, you can kind of use their, the app to find out where it is and go find it and it can beep at you and stuff. Both stick and find and hip key um, have this concept of proximity, which is 
is uh, kind of an important part of Bluetooth low energy. Um, there are some features of it that make uh, detecting proximity, like how far away the device is from you, pretty easy to do. So it's kind of an interesting thing you can do with Bluetooth low energy. This is another smartwatch. This is similar to the Citizen, except this one actually has a digital display. This is a Kickstarter um, you know, thing that came to fruition recently. So it can show you uh, unread email or alert you if you miss a call or uh, social media updates. I'm particularly fascinated by this, and I, I've already had two examples of this, the Citizen Watch and this one. Um, this kind of remote display concept is really cool because um, you can build a peripheral like this with a battery that lasts for months or a year, like a normal wristwatch would, and you don't have to build in a web server or like connect to Wi-Fi or anything on the peripheral. You don't have to like have code in there to connect to Twitter and you know monitor tweets and stuff like that. You can do all that on the phone where we all have experience doing that as software developers kind of harness that power of the phone and keep the device simple and um, have a you know really low power radio in it. So yeah. Um, it's, I, I think the maximum range is like 160 feet, like the theoretical maximum when conditions are perfect and you're in an open field or, yeah. Um, in testing with devices, it, it's pretty good. It's usually like 30 to 50 feet. Okay. Um, so it's, it's uh, very reasonable and usable. Um, it's the, the, we'll, we'll talk about, I'll touch on that. I have a slide for the kind of ranges. Um, it's about half of the theoretical range of Bluetooth class. Bluetooth Classic, which is about 300 feet. But it also depends on which version of Bluetooth Classic you're talking about. Um, it's gone through several iterations since the 90s when it was introduced. So it's not quite, um, not quite as far as Bluetooth Classic. So you talked about how awesome, I know I've totally convinced you guys how awesome Bluetooth Low Energy is, right? Yes, um, maybe, I don't know. But there, there are limitations. The primary limitation is that it's slow. And it's not just slow, it's really slow. Here's a chart. Um, taller bars. <laughs> T taller bars are better on this chart, yeah. So we're, um, in terms of uh, speed of transmission, we're, we're nowhere near the Wi-Fi ballpark. We're more in the carrier pigeon ballpark down here. Um, so this chart really doesn't do anything other than to say, we're, you know, you're not gonna use Bluetooth Low Energy to be streaming video or something. It's, it's meant for small bursts of small amounts of information. So here's a, these are kind of observed transfer rates. Um, the theor theoretical ones are a lot higher, but we're talking about 50 kilobits per second. Um, Bluetooth Classic is about 1.2 megs, megabits. Um, but it's important to, to keep in mind that when, uh, when we say it's slow, like Bluetooth Low Energy is slow, that's strictly data rate. Um, there are, it's optimized for um, being fast in other ways, like communicating really quickly. Wake up time is a good indicator of that. Um, two to six milliseconds to go from sleep state to fully awake and transmitting data versus Bluetooth Classic, which is like super slow. And anytime you sync your device or you have a mouse and you're trying to wake up your computer or something, you know like there's a lot of lag time with Bluetooth Classic. So um, Bluetooth low energy peripherals feel a lot more responsive. And you'll see that when we do the demos. Um, when you scan for a device, it shows up right away. And then this is just, we already talked about that, but a range comparison um, for distance. So Bluetooth low energy is about half the range of Bluetooth Classic. Okay, before we go into demos, any questions? So we're gonna do three things. Um, going to scan for a device and connect to it, discover services. Once we, once we connect, then we can figure out um, uh, how to discover services and read data and then update a remote display. So before we do those demos, um, to learn some kind of terminology and, and dive into core Bluetooth a little bit. Core Bluetooth really mimics the Bluetooth low energy standard for its terminology. So it introduces a couple new concepts. Um, this is good if you're kind of, if you're familiar with Bluetooth, but if you're new to Bluetooth, then these aren't gonna make any sense like central. Um, central, you can kind of think of as like a central hub. This is the thing that's like responsible for connecting to peripherals. And then we have a peripheral here. So the way this works is the central has to scan and the peripheral advertises itself. And you can't create an, a connection without this step. Advertising is essential. So the peripheral must advertise itself. And in order for these two things to become aware of each other, that has to happen at the right time. So the central has to scan and the peripheral has to advertise. And once they see each other, then they can establish a connection and start uh, transmitting data. Um, so in core Bluetooth, primarily we're gonna be using uh, CV Central Manager. 
And if you've done core location or pretty much any other Apple framework you're familiar kind of with this concept, we have two, um, two kind of things we need to use, an instance of the central manager, and then um, we tell the OS we want to start scanning for devices, and then we get callbacks on our delegate. So a call looks like this. We can say, I want to scan for peripherals. And then when the OS discovers peripherals, we just basically wait for these messages to come in. When it discovers some peripherals, it will let us know, and then it's up to us to do something with those peripherals. So once we discover a peripheral, um, we have a reference to it, and we can try to establish a connection. And it's a similar situation there. We say connect to peripheral, and if it's successful, we get a call back, did connect to peripheral. Um, so I know I already mentioned this, but just to reiterate, this is really cool because you can do this stuff in the background. You can start a scan in your app, and you can completely shut down your app, and the OS will continue to monitor for you on your behalf, even if your phone is in sleep mode. If it dis detects your peripheral, it will let your app know, and you'll have a chance to do something with it. There are limitations associated with that. Um, we don't have a lot of enough time to kind of go into those limitations, but we can certainly talk about it later. Um, OK, so scanning and connecting. So this is the app we're going to build. Uh, Pretty simple, we just have like an on off button. Um, we can start a scan and then um, it'll list the devices that get, scan that get discovered and then we can try to establish a connection by tapping on the one that gets discovered. Um, so in order for this to work, um, basically we have this uh, Arduino here, I'm gonna plug this in but I'm just plugging it in for power purposes, no monkey business, this is actually wireless, <laughs> I promise. Um, so there's not much to see at this point. Um, this is just kind of light up a little, light up a little bit. Um, but really, initially, we just want to establish a connection to it. Um, and I want to kind of preface this by saying uh, I'm not going to go. We're using like view controllers and table views and stuff. So if you're not an iOS developer, um, don't worry about that too much. Um, I'm just going to kind of assume you know the the basic structure of the app. And all of this code is available and it's annotated online. So if you want to look at the code later, it's out there and available. So kind of the first step um, happens when we instantiate our view controller. We create a reference to our central manager and we send in ourself as a delegate right here. So that just sets, it up, sets us up to start receiving these notifications when devices are discovered. And a couple other basic things, we're just gonna keep an array of peripherals that we discover and then we just have a, a Boolean telling us whether we're scanning or not. We can kind of just use that to update the UI. So when the user toggles the scan switch to on, we're actually gonna initiate a scan. And the first step in doing that is checking the state of the central manager. Um, we can only scan if power is if it's powered on. Um, there are maybe five or seven different states that this could be in. Maybe there's not even a Bluetooth low energy radio on this device. So in the demo app, we're just going to look for powered on. And if it's not powered on, we're just gonna uh, send a generic alert to the user. But in a production app, obviously, you can check the state and then take the appropriate action based on what the current state is. Um, then we just start a scan. And by passing nil in for services, we'll talk about services and, and um, stuff in a minute, but by passing in nil, we can just scan for any Bluetooth low energy device. And if the OS discovers one, it'll send us a, a callback notification. So now we just wait. We started to scan. Um, and we wait, eventually the iPhone will discover a peripheral and when it does, it invokes this method automatically for us. It gives us a reference to the peripheral and advertisement and data and RSSI. These two things um, just give us more information about this connection. Some Bluetooth low energy devices like a thermostat, you might not ever actually connect to. Maybe you just read its advertisement data. So you can actually encode a little bit of information, very small amount, in the advertisement data from your peripheral. So you don't actually ever have to establish a connection in that case. You can just do a scan, get the temperature from the thermostat, and then you're done. Um, in our case, we actually do want to establish a connection. Uh, one more note, RSSI, this is a signal strength. So this is kind of related to proximity. You can tell based on how strong the signal you're reading is. and You can actually, um, you could configure your peripheral to send its trans transmit signal strength and then read the received signal strength on the phone and then do lots of complicated, crazy math to figure out, oh, we know it transmitted it this strong and we're receiving it at this strong and this is about how far away it is. How far away it is. So we've, we've received a notification that there's a peripheral. We check to see if it's in our array. The reason we do this is because we could get multiple notifications for the same peripheral. It might come in three or four times. Um, so we check to see if, we've ha if we have it. If we don't have it yet, then we add it to our array and we update the table view. 
So at this point, it shows up in the table view and the user can tap on it. So now we wait for user interaction. The next step is when the user selects that row, we call this method connect peripheral. Then we wait again. And if that connection succeeds, then the OS will invoke this method for us, did connect peripheral. And at this point, we just show our detail view controller. Uh, so let's try it out. Okay, and there's also lots of log information that's gonna be printed out. If you do download the code and kind of experiment with it, this could be useful. It's probably not gonna be super helpful for these demos. So you can see that the scan pretty quickly picked up the Bluetooth peripheral, and this name just comes from the way the peripheral was designed. Um, when we tap on that cell, we'll try to connect, and it's not gonna work. Okay. Uh, sometimes, um, this is a, one of the quirks with this Bluetooth low energy USB thing. Sometimes you have to like claim it with the simulator. So if you put your computer to sleep or something, sometimes you have to come in and do this. So I hope this is what it is. We'll try it one more time. Okay, there we go. So now we have a connection. All right, so that's the first demo. So now we have a connection, we can start to try to do fun things with this peripheral. Um, we want to find out what kind of services this peripheral offers us and then read data from it. So we're gonna add a little bit of information to our detail view here, which is a message. The Arduino is programmed to um, create a random message and just update it every three seconds. So we're going to just read that random string from the Arduino just as a demo. Before we do that, uh, I just wanna introduce Bluetooth profiles. Uh, profile is um, just a container for the services that your Bluetooth low energy peripheral provides. It's made up of one or more services and services are made up of one or more characteristics and characteristics have a descriptor. So uh, a concrete example of this is a thermometer. Um, thermometer service has three characteristics, in this case measurement, location, and interval. Measurement being the, the temperature, location is where the thermometer is, and then interval is how often that value is updated. So the concept here is you can, you can create your own um, profiles, and in fact, the, the creator of this Bluetooth adapter for our Bluetooth Low Energy Shield for Arduino created this really simple profile. So this is what we're going to interact with. Profile, profile basically has an RX characteristic and a TX characteristic, and we can read these characteristics to um, read from the RX characteristic, and then if we wanna send data back to the Arduino, we can write to the TX characteristic. And each one of these has a UUID value associated with it. This, again, is defined by the author. So this is, you can create your own profiles, you can assign your own UUIDs, and then publish this information. So um, in our case, for the demo apps, we looked up the details online for this peripheral, and now we know what the UUIDs are, and we can connect to them and do things with the characteristics. So um, just a quick overview of CB peripheral. Now that we have a, a reference to this peripheral and we have a connection to it, we can call discover services. And again, the OS takes care of all the hard work for us, just sends us back an array of services. And we do similar thing with characteristics. We just read characteristics um, or discover characteristics and then get back an array of all the characteristics for, for a particular service. Um, one interesting thing, what we're gonna do for the demo app is we could, we know that this message is getting updated on the Arduino. So we could keep reading that characteristic over and over and over and just polling for a new value. But we don't know necessarily if that value was updated when we pull for it. So we might get the same value back, which is a waste of power. Um, we can set, we can tell the peripheral, we can call set notify value, and we can tell the peripher peripheral to notify us every time that that value changes on the peripheral. So when it does, then it sends us back a callback, um, did update value for characteristics. So this is much easier. We don't have to pull for, the, pull for that information. We can just tell the peripheral, let us know when you have a new value. So we are going to read from the Rx characteristic and update this message on the detail page. Let's look at the code for that. Okay, so first up, we're, we're going to call um, discover services. 
on this peripheral right when the detailed page is displayed. And remember, this is gonna let the OS do all the hard work for us, and it's just gonna send us a call back with an array of services. So we call that, um, we sit back and wait, and we'll get back an array of services. So here's to discover services. Um, for each service that we get back from this call, we'll loop through and call discover characteristics. So we're looking for that Rx characteristic. So now we wait again, eventually we'll get another call back. This, is, this one's a little bit more involved. So once we get the characteristics back, we need to kind of sift through these characteristics and hook up to the one that we want. The one that we want, we know the UUID for. So we've got the UUID defined right here. And this is from the documentation that the creator of this peripheral provided. Um, we need to turn these, this is just kind of a, a thing we need to do, but we need to take these strings and turn them into CVUUID values. We can compare those CVUUID values um, with the values we get back from the callbacks from Core Bluetooth. So we check for the service to make sure that it's the one that, that we're interested in, and then for each characteristic that comes back, we loop through those, and we compare the characteristic UUID with the one that we know is the one we want. In this case, it's the Rx characteristic. And we can call set notify value yes for characteristic. So we don't actually read anything at this point. We just tell the peripheral we want to get updates. Let us know when this value changes. If it's the TX characteristic, we're just gonna keep a reference to that for now, and we'll use that in the third demo. So um, we'll get back to that. Yep. Um, it's up to the, um, it's defined in the profile. So the profile can say, yes, this is a characteristic that supports updates, or no, it doesn't. So this isn't av available for everything. And, and for some things like, um, I don't know what a good example is. Maybe like on the, in the thermostat, like the, the frequency of updates it was one of the characteristic. That's never gonna change. It's just like a, a known value. You just wanna read that from the peripheral. So it, it doesn't really make sense in every case. Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're asking. Um, it does, it does, yes, yeah. Once the connection is established, they know about each other. And they take on different roles depending on how they're connected. Um, it, it's, uh, Bluetooth, core Bluetooth makes that very simple from a software developer standpoint. There's a lot of craziness going on in the Bluetooth spec that handles all that, like the roles of the devices. But they, they do know about each other, yeah. So we'll keep a reference to the TX characteristic and we're gonna just sit back and wait for notif notifications for the Rx characteristic. And eventually, when um, the peripheral lets us know, we get this call back in our, in our code. And in our, in our case, we know that the Arduino is sending us ASCII data. So we grab that characteristic and just turn it into a, a string. Just translate it from NS data to an ASCII string and update the label in our table view. So let's run that demo. So we just wait, eventually we should get updates, maybe. There it is. And it should change every few seconds. Okay. Is this session, the session is over at 11, is that right? Does anybody know? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's demo number two. Demo number three, we're going to try to remote update a, a remote display. You know what a fan of this concept I am, so we're going to try to kind of make a very simple version of this um, with this Arduino. It's got an LED display on the front. So what we're gonna do is um, I have some software in the iOS app that monitors Twitter for a hashtag, and I'm gonna need your assistance. Hopefully some of you can help me out here. If you tweet with a hashtag, then um, the iOS app will monitor that the count basically of tweets with that hashtag, and then send an update to the peripheral to just kind of increment the number on the display. Um, Here's the hashtag. Don't tweet it yet, though. We can't uh, actually tweet it until we make a connection to the peripheral, so hold your horses. Uh, okay, so one last demo. Um, just look at the, take a quick look at the code here. Um, this is just a constant for the hashtag that we're gonna search for, and there's lots of other code that makes a connection to Twitter, a streaming connection, just counts the updates. When those, um, tweets come in, we check to see if we have a reference to that TX characteristic, and we create an NS data object, and then call 
um, peripheral write value for characteristic, and that just sends the data over Bluetooth low energy to the peripheral. So the Arduino is programmed to receive that and then update the LED display. So I'll hold this up here. Hopefully, hopefully we can make this happen. <laughs> Try to connect as many like fragile uh, pieces together as possible <laughs> for this demo. We've got like Wi-Fi, Twitter, Bluetooth. Okay, so if you tweet, um, I should start see that, seeing that increment. There's one, and they'll show up in the log down here as well. Eight, sweet, yeah, you guys are awesome. Cool, and this, this isn't happening over USB. I know there's a cable here, but it's all wireless, so cool. All right. Um, okay, so just to recap, uh, introduction of Bluetooth low energy, convinced you it's awesome, hopefully. I think it's awesome, um, and did some cool demos, so hope you enjoyed it, thanks. We still have a couple minutes, so if anybody has questions. Yep. Is there a connection to pairing mode? Yeah, um, Bluetooth Low Energy supports very similar pairing and kind of security encryption and stuff options as Bluetooth Classic does. In order to initiate that in software, you basically, on the peripheral side, this is all documented by Apple, but on the peripheral side, you just reject a connection. So in our iOS app, we click on the row to establish a connection with the peripheral. If the peripheral rejects that initial connection, then the OS will automatically try to pair with that device and establish a different kind of connection. So it does support that, yeah. Yeah? You were saying earlier that uh, you can experiment a little bit of like data into the advertisement to the peripheral uh, response mode. Yep. What, what's the little bit? Like, you know, the uh, I think it's like 37 bytes or something like that. So yeah, the payload for Bluetooth is very small just to maximize battery life. But yeah, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's in the tens of bytes. Okay.